Yay! Yay. Yeah. We've decided to go lower I at went. the beginning. <laughs> you went right <laughs> up there. What's up, everyone? Welcome to, uh, I almost said Jamil Curry Live. Hey, we can call it that tonight. <laughs> tonight. Spoilers, though. Tonight, uh, it is officially Jamil Curry Live. Uh, Ginger <laughs> Runner Live, episode number 277. Our guest, Jamil Curry, is on the show. We love having this guy on. <laughs> He is full of stories. He's full of fun, uh, vim and vigor. Uh, he's race director, YouTube creator, filmmaker, ultra runner, extraordinaire, adventurer. Guy has many hats, both literally <laughs> and Come metaphorically. On. It was a bad. I'm already <laughs> off to a rough start. Uh, after two weeks of races for both Kim and myself, we're uh, keeping things super professional tonight. Super profesh. <laughs> and the sleep has been, yeah, there's tons of it. We've had tons <laughs> of sleep in the last couple of weeks. But uh, we're excited about tonight's show because we're going to yes. talk to Jamil all about his experience at the Whistler Alpine Meadows 100 miler. This was the first year of this distance at this event. Uh, it's a Gary Robbins special. The Wham series, Whistler Alpine Meadows, uh, features a bunch of distances. And this was like the big dream of Gary was to do this 100-mile event. Super rugged, over 30,000 feet of gain. Uh, up in the Whistler Alpine, you get to see some incredible views, mountaintops. There was weather. A whole bunch of stories from this weekend. And our wonderful guest tonight, Jamil Curry, ran it the inaugural year. And I guess he has a penchant for finding inaugural hundreds. And we're going to talk to him a little bit about that tonight. So sit back, relax, everyone. Welcome to Ginger Runner Live or Jamil Curry Live. <laughs> Episode number 277, the show. Begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! Yay! Sorry. You're bringing in like a little extra tonight. I did bring a little bit of extra. Uh, it might be due in part to this. We're partaking in some sour. Um, it's like the sourest sour I've ever had. It's well, one of the dirty coach. Dirty Couch Sour, the local uh, local brewery. Another uh, our friend Ryan Thrower, who's um, who we've talked about on the show many times. He's been helping us out here at Ginger Runner. He also works at some of these breweries and has provided us with some samples. And uh, when he talks about sours, it's in this like realm of beyond anything you've tasted as far as sours are concerned. So I apologize if you get a lot of like salivary sounds tonight if you're listening in the podcast. <laughs> Uh, and a lot of like bitter faces because it's super sour, which is delicious. It's just super intense. Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, <laughs> episode number 277. We appreciate you taking some time out of your busy Mondays to spend a little bit of it with us. It's nothing like starting a show uh, better than talking about salivary sounds. Oh, God, I'm so sorry already. <laughs> uh, if you've already heard my salivary sounds, I apologize. It's a, a huge pet peeve. And in a podcast, like when you're running or just listening to the audio form and that's all you can hear, now that I've already said it, that's all you can hear, I, and I'm already sorry. Um, our guest tonight, I'm so excited to have him back on. Jamil Curry is just a badass ultra runner, adventurer, uh, race director, filmmaker, YouTuber, and uh, has just taken the sport and moved it into a whole, a whole other realm. It's just so great to have him on the show. We've had him on a number of times, and it's always a fun, story-filled uh, adventure. He's just He's also a complete badass, has attempted Barclays multiple times, and uh, just has so many great stories from that. This last weekend was the inaugural Whistler Alpine Meadows 100-mile event. Now, this uh, has been going on for about four years. They've had various distance events there, 110K, 55K, 25K, uh, an ascent as well, mm -hmm. which is on Friday. It's a shorter but extremely steep race. Um, and it's a Gary Robbins special put on um, by our lovely friend Gary Robbins and his whole crew of incredible volunteers. <laughs> This last weekend, Jamil Curry, our guest tonight, ran the inaugural Whistler Alpine Meadows 100 Milers. We're going to talk to him here in just a couple seconds about all, all about that race. Uh, and his uh, he apparently likes to run inaugural hundreds, and he's probably got some stories there too. But it was a rugged, crazy weather-filled race, and we're going to talk to Jamil all about it in tonight's show. And it's not just myself, it's not just our guest Jamil, but... Also. What's up, you guys? Hi. Kim Tashima Newberry here. If you're new to the show, welcome. Uh, we are live with our wonderful guest, Jamil. If you guys have questions for him, please pop them into the chat room. I'll keep be keeping my eye out in there. Everything Sorry. okay over there? Got it. Go uh, in. Yeah, we'll be pulling questions throughout the hour. So, so anything, anything and everything. Yes. Now, before we introduce our guests and start digging into it, we have some individuals that we like to thank, of course, at the top of every show. And those are our Patreon supporters, the members of our community who support us 
allow us to do this live show every single Monday, uh, do films, reviews, do this YouTube channel full time. And it's because of them that we're able to do this. So a huge shout out to all of our supporters at patreon.com slash the ginger runner. Three individuals in particular at that top tier. We like to give a shout out at the top of every show. Chris Lee in Hong Kong and his organization Trailblazer. Uh, Chris is an ultra runner himself and uh, has this organization that showcases the trails in the Hong Kong region. If you find yourself over there visiting or maybe running a race, maybe make sure to reach out to Chris and his organization. They have a brick and mortar place. You can go pick up supplies, shoes, gear, whatever you need, and uh, they can point you in the right direction to find some of the best trails. Rick Bjarnason and his team at cheekymonkeymedia.ca. They're a web design company based out of British Columbia, but they handle websites across the globe, no matter where you're located, including myself, gingerrunner.com, uh, was completely designed by this team. And Rick, and uh, Rick himself is an ultra runner, finishing Sinister Seven this summer, uh, super, badass, um, really powerful runner, and uh, it's great to have him on board helping us out. And finally, Brian Sands, longtime friend, longtime supporter of the show. Brian has an incredibly inspiring journey, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like he's just getting started. He trained for his first marathon. Uh, he's lost over 100 pounds. He's ran his first 50K, and he's going to be at, surprisingly, uh, Jamil Curry has a very close connection to the Aravipa running community um, and Havelina 100. And Brian Sands will be at the Havelina 100, 100K. 100K, yep. And uh, we'll be down there uh, spectating and supporting and, and crewing be, for friends. I and, get the privilege of pacing Brian a little bit there yes, this year. So. Yes. So a big shout out to those three individuals for helping us do what we do here full time. It is a, it's a wonderful privilege that we get, and it's all thanks to our Patreon supporters. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our incredibly patient guest uh, who <laughs> is pro I don't know if he's on, maybe he can answer it for us, but maybe he's falling asleep. I don't know if he's tired at this point. He's done so many hundreds that maybe it's just like, ah, that was hard. I'm gonna- <laughs> That was cute. That was cute. I'm gonna get some food and go watch some Netflix or something. Maybe that's his way of, of uh, relaxing, but without further ado, here he is, Jamil Curry. Yay! Hey, thanks, guys. Yeah, okay, man. Be welcome. Before we get into it, did you just say you're coming to Havelina 100? Oh, we may not oh, have told you, yeah, but we'll yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll be there. <laughs> That's exciting. You're like, oh, yeah, we're going to be there. By That's the way, exciting. Uh, yeah. That's, We've been I'm, telling you for years that we're going to come down. Exactly. And this is the year that it's actually happening. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I'm, I'm really excited now. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. This has been a giant <laughs> prank. Um, <laughs> the whole point was to bring you on. You're so funny. I'm hilarious. <laughs> yeah, man, we've been talking about it for years. I know that you've invited us for years, and you you and Jubes and the entire crew have such an amazing event. And every year, we regret not being able to go. Yes. This is the year that we're like, <laughs> we're going. We may not be running uh, the 100 miler, but we're going to have lots of friends that are, and we want to support. So yeah, we'll be there. That's awesome. Are you going to be there? Uh, I think I can pencil it in. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> That's one I, I I will never miss that one. So yeah. I I'm actually really like how are you feeling now? Because you this isn't your first rodeo. It's not your first hundred mile event or ultra by any means. So like, are you exhausted? Are you recovered? Are you home? <clears throat> yeah. I actually I had a quick turnaround. I had a 8 a.m. flight out of Vancouver yesterday. So. I finished at 7 p.m. Saturday night, and I think I had to be up at 3.30 to start driving to the airport, you know, a few hours later, um, you know, dad life calls, so had to be back home. Uh, but yeah, kind of right back in the swing of things. Um, but I feel, I actually feel pretty good physically. Um, could probably use a little more sleep, but doing, doing pretty well, all things considered. So before we even like, dig into wham itself um i learned this this weekend is that you you have sort of a passion for first year hundreds uh what is the, is there something about running a first year hundred or, or an inaugural event that sort of attracts you to it or was there something about this one in particular yeah i think it's a combination i don't i don't just like you know for the sake of it doing a first year hundred but if it's one that sounds interesting it's fun. I think it's fun to do the first year. It introduces a new element to the race, so like a little more adventure because granted, you know, I know Gary, he does an excellent job and I, you know, I wasn't thinking there'd be massive things wrong with the race. Um, but you never know, especially sometimes a first year organizer of a first year hundred is even right. crazier, which I've done before. And it just interjects a different sense of adventure and you have to go into it thinking like that. So 
I've done that before where like say the I did the Grand Mesa 100 mm. the inaugural year back in 2010 and yeah there was definitely some things that went wrong there um <laughs> there was like course marking issues and just like all kinds of crazy things they had it was such a small race they had their coworkers working the aid stations and like their mm. nephew from high school and his friends so just if it, it, it was really cool though um and but I went into it expecting the unexpected and okay. I got that in a lot of different ways. So I was kind of prepared for that. But if you, ex if you're expecting everything to run smoothly, like a, a Western States or something else has it dialed, um, it might mentally screw up your race. If like you lose the course for a bit, you might drop or something. So, um, for me, yeah, it's just, it was just kind of a little extra challenge sometimes to do those first year ones. Like, uh, not including Whistler in this one at all. I know obviously Gary Robbins is one of the most seasoned race directors out there with Squamish races and his Coastal Mountain Trail series and that whole thing. But I've heard other stories of other races, inaugural hundreds especially, that have just like they have all the marketing right. They have all the word of mouth right. They have the location right. But I've heard stories from people who have run them afterwards that are like everything went wrong, like the potential for uh, disaster is high. So for our listening audience or for runners who maybe are looking at a, a, a race, it's like, this looks really cool, but it's a first year race. Are there anything, are there any, is there anything that they can look at to like go into it with a, a, uh, certain mentality or, uh, what should they prepare in advance in this sort of scenario? What questions should they ask? Like, how can they prepare themselves for the potential of like, <laughs> the risks of our first year event. Yeah, I think there's definitely some things you can do. Uh, studying the course really closely, I think, is a really good idea. I didn't do that as much for this one. Number one, because, um, you know, Gary puts 10,000 flags out on the course. Yes. So he, he marks it insanely well. It's the things lit up like I have never seen a, a trail before. And um, also, I, I did take the time to download the entire route onto my phone in the Gaia app. So I had that with me. So it's kind of an insurance policy. Granted, you know, you could break your phone and you'd be out of luck. But in the past, before technology is where it's at today, I've, you know, literally spent hours poring over maps, studying turns, reading just turn by turn descriptions, sometimes even printing them out and laminating them and carrying them with me. I did that at the first year of Mogollon Monster. I carried literally the race director's descriptions and, and course map. So I was like anticipating the next turn on the course because yeah. sometimes volunteers can be misinformed. It's the first year they don't know or, you know, it gets mismarked or some course vandalism changes something. They don't know the tricky turns. So that's definitely something, you know, knowing the course is super important. Uh, another thing is self-reliance is just being prepared. Maybe an aid station doesn't get to the right spot in time or, they're missing something or volunteer, a critical volunteer falls through, something happens that a lot of times there's redundancies in when you put on multiple races, but right. in a first year, you might not know. Um, yeah, there might also be not very great communications for the director. I've seen that before in first year hundreds or even medical support. So I don't know. I'm not saying to carry like a giant first aid kit, but yeah, maybe knowing some things or just being prepared for the for things to go wrong and mm -hmm. you might have to kind of troubleshoot. Yeah, it seems just kind of like a heightened sense of preparedness. I mean, I, I feel like any race that, I've, that I'm running that I'm not familiar with in general, there's certain steps I'm like, oh, I should probably, yeah, memorize the course or even download it to Gaia or something. And it, I mean, it happened at Headlands too. Mm -hmm. I, I ran into people who didn't, who were off course already, mm -hmm. very well marked, a lot of communication beforehand about loop course changes. Loop-based course. Loop-based course. It's, yep. I mean, you are on trails that you're running past people in both directions. And I saw people off course and it was like, how is this happening? But there <laughs> are there's certain people that maybe just put all the trust in a race organization, but there's certainly a level of like preparedness that I think everyone needs to go into these races. So did you feel uh, that you went into this with an additional level of preparedness that you would to any of the hundreds that you run, or was there a level of trust? Because it is a Gary Robbins race where you kind of had this, he'll take care of me, but I'll have my medical supplies like you just mentioned. Like, did you bring that sort of stuff with you <clears> on <throat> this one? 
Um, no, I put my trust in Gary for sure. Um, and you know, I mean, he was so thorough with his pre-race emails. I think we got, I mean, I signed up for the race very last minute. And so as soon as I signed up for the race, which was like a week before the, the event, I got 10 emails from coast mountain trail series, just like popping in my inbox. I was like, oh, man, I got some homework to do. Uh, I kept saying that to Ethan every time I'd get a new email. I'm like, oh, my God, another email. And then I got an email with the list of emails I should have already received. Yeah. Here's an email with the list of emails in case you didn't get the emails. And if you didn't read those emails, this is the email you need to read. There was the final email, which is the the promise that there's no more emails. And then there were two more emails after that email. So, um, yeah. And then we had... A re- he read aloud an email at the start line too. So, <laughs> just kidding. It was it was great covering, but like he covered the per- whole base of the entire. Totally. Yeah, he basically yeah. read the entire website and waiver at the start line. Which it, it, it's good to hear it again, though. There was you know it's this mountain race like it's a it's no joke. It's a serious thing. There's no pacers. There's required gear. You know, not just a space blanket, but a emergency bivy sack so and once you're out there on this course and you know fortunately for me i was out of the rain i was done before it started but man all the people that went through that second night yeah. all the 100 110k runners through went through the night man it'd be dicey up there if like you roll roll an ankle and can't move um so it's the precaution precautions are necessary it's a serious mountain race so um it's good to see you know a guy like gary taking it seriously and giving folks all the information they need to approach it and be successful. I, uh, uh, of course, we are going to be talking also a little bit, uh, we didn't even mention this at the beginning of the show, but I want to make sure we mention it now, that Kim also ran the 110K, attempted the 110K Wham race. We are going to talk about Kim's race in the after show with yes. our uh, Patreon crew. We've got a lot of stories and stuff like that from that. But I do want to start digging into this race. You guys ended up sharing very similar parts of the course, like the first 50K of the 110K are very similar to the first 50K of the 100 mile course. Um, But let's talk about the course as a whole so we can kind of give it a generalized idea of what this monster is, the Wham. So Jamil, can you kind of give us an idea of like what it is, what are the stats on it, what drew you to it, uh, why is it an expert level race? I mean, Wham is a great acronym for it because it just feels like you get like just get whammed by this course. I don't know. Um, but I heard about this race several years ago. I think we were organizing a women's training program. We were trying to get him to run. I don't know if it was the 55 K just back then might've been the first year. Um, but it just looked beautiful. You know, Whistler is, you know, an iconic destination up in British Columbia. I'd never been there before. Just, you know, it looks beautiful. It sounds rugged and amazing. And it is. And, uh, so that's kind of was very appealing to me. The fact that it was, had over 30,000 feet of climb and, you know, 104 miles. We all love those bonus smiles over a hundred. <laughs> no, but you have, you, you have yeah, such... also, like, let's be clear. The hundred miler was like 104, maybe 105 miles. And the 110 K <laughs> was closer to 115, but then Gary do- knocked off one kilometer. So he said it might be, you know, you might only have three and a half to four bonus kilometers in the hundred. You get your money's <laughs> worth. And there's a great, uh, if you haven't seen it already, but Jamil's Instagram is hilarious because you were doing some Instagram stories throughout the event. But my favorite is you're at mile 100. Your watch is there with 100 miles on it. And you're in the fucking middle of nowhere. Like you're in the woods with single track. Mountain bike, mountain bike trails just <laughs> yeah. pointlessly winding back and forth. It sounds like, like comfortably numb. Yeah, it sounds like comfortably <laughs> numb. Uh, it's just a great moment because I can only imagine running 100 miles through, I mean, just rough course. And yeah. you're at 100 miles, and you're like, you got to be kidding me. Like, I, yeah, get, I, I get it. I got 105.3 on my watch. So, you got your money's worth. Canadian dollars worth. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe that's the discount. You know, it's 100 US miles, <laughs> but 105 Canadian miles. I don't know. Was there. Was there something that really drew you to this one? So was it the Whistler Alpine goodness? Were there pictures or was it because you'd never been to this region before? Uh, or was it just the promise of getting your ass kicked? <laughs> it, kind of all of the above. I definitely, you know, I actually, I think for the first time since I started running hundred milers, I didn't run a hundred mile race last year. I did 200 mile at Tahoe, but I didn't run a hundred mile race. And then I was on track for that this year. Hard Rock got canceled. So I felt like, ah, I haven't, I feel like I haven't done a hundred. I need to kind of redeem myself or just 
validate myself as a proper ultra runner. I don't know. And, um, so that's kind of why I did it. Plus the views from that I saw of up top were amazing. And those delivered far and away. It was incredible. I saw the sunrise up on Whistler, uh, Whistler mountain and it, it was unbelievable. There was in this inversion layer of clouds below and then the glaciated peaks as far as you could see. And it was something else. Um, I'm from the desert in Arizona. We don't see glaciers and inversion layers here very often, ever. <laughs> <laughs> I like that it's very often, but occasionally. Yeah. You can like, see glaciers. And, now and again, so. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's the famous alpine up there. And uh, your videos and pictures and stuff, I can't wait to see what sort of video you, you ended up creating. But uh, I do want to remind everyone that, of course, we are live. Kim has pulled a bunch of questions aside. So we'll get to those uh, as we talk to Jamil about the Wham 100. What do we got? Uh, yeah, Marianne in the chat room says, Jamil, is this your first time to Canada? Any more Canadian races in mind? Uh, I think a second time. The only other time I went was about, it might have been 15 years ago to Niagara Falls. So that's total, right. You mentioned that. Totally the same type of experience. <laughs> same, exact. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, and I guess, um, yeah, the directors of, I think, the like Sinister Seven and some of the other races, I think they're in Alberta, they were trying to get me to come out this summer. I couldn't make it work with the scheduling. So, I mean, those interest me. They look pretty cool as well. It'd be fun to do more. Yeah, lots of... I A lot mean, of challenging races yeah. in Canada. Yeah. Canada is known for its races just being challenging, even if, they're, even if its reputation is an easy ultra or an easy race. There's usually nothing quite easy uh, in the Canadian mountains, for sure. Uh, what else we got? Uh, yeah, A2B2 in the chat room says, how would you compare Wham 100 Miler to Hard Rock? Um, I mean, Hard Rock, I mean, obviously, of the, uh, the altitude. So that is a, a big difference. Wham tops out around 7,000 feet, but a lot of the running is lower down between two and 4,000 feet. So you don't really have the altitude factor for most people. Um, but Hard Rock is, you know, it's a single loop course, whereas Wham, you kind of have this uh, little out and back section over Whistler, so you kind of don't cover as much ground. And Hard Rock, I think, is a lot more relentless from just from the get-go. Wham kind of rolled along for the first 30 or 40 miles. Like, you didn't, you had little climbs, but nothing too big. Um, but then they hit, they hit you hard on the back half. I mean, a couple 5,000 foot climbs in a row and then another 4,000 foot climb. It was, it was a lot. <laughs> Looking at the elevation profile of this race, it, it lures you in with this sort of like, oh, it's got this front half that's got these little flat. squiggles. It's a, that's the flat section. The flat Everybody's section. joking on course of like, oh, this is a flat section. It's a flat 30 miles of the course. But the first 30 miles have close to like 9,000 feet of gain. It's that last uh, 50 K 60 miles that has another like 18,000 feet again, 20,000 feet again, or something that puts you up in over 30,000 feet. Uh, so it's a monstrous amount of climbing in that back half where you're climbing Whistler twice, black home once, uh, it's nuts. So I kind of want to hear, um, how your race unfolded because you haven't run a hundred miler this year. Uh, you obviously have some huge races under your belt from the past. So being able to sort of train, is that a, is that something that you're doing regularly? Are you, did you feel like you were trained going into this ready for this? Or was it like a, I'm ready for the adventure? I mean, I had very little recent training. I ran a 50 mile week the week before the event. And in the six weeks prior to that, I was averaging 18 miles a week. Um, <laughs> so like a couple of weeks had like seven miles that was one run, you know, and I did run Hell OCC, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it was, yeah, pretty much off the couch. I was very much pulling from maybe training earlier this year, just like mm -hmm. a lifetime of running ultras for 14 years. I think that's really what got me through this. Um, and I, you know, I didn't start out hard. I had zero pressure, um, you know, no, no pressure at all. I literally just signed up for this thing. I just showed up, you know, I was just by myself. I was just there to enjoy the experience. And so... That was my guiding principle. If I wanted to walk, sure, it doesn't matter. Just kind of chilling out, especially the first half. So that's what I did, really. Um, and I think that attitude definitely helped throughout the the event. Um, and I'm not 
you know, crazy beat up right now either. But there were some stretches where I was able to, I felt like I was pushing pretty hard and running pretty strong, even though it was painful. <laughs> I I kind of want to talk a little bit about that beginning half. So that or the beginning like 50K or so. So it's rolling, undulating. Most of the climbs are somewhere between 1,000 to 3,000 feet. Uh, you're not getting any of the 5,000 foot climbs at this point, but are you getting views? It's dark. I mean, I guess you started later in the morning. So we, so the 110 K started at 4 AM. You guys started the day before at 10 AM, right? Right. Yep. So are you getting what, what this is sort of your first experience running in the Pacific Northwest sort of rainforest, lush woods. Yeah. Are you enjoying it? Is it, are you not getting the views that you're used to? Like, <laughs> how is it for someone from out of country from yeah. Phoenix running in the Whistler Alpine? Um, I was hope honestly, like to be totally honest, I was hoping for more views early on. Um, I didn't feel like we were getting much in the first 20 or so, at least, where we're just kind of in the trees. You, every now and again, you get like a little glimpse of maybe a lake or something, but n really not a lot of views. Um, even though it was a nice day, it wasn't socked in the day we started. And I think I was talking to some runners out there. He might have had to change the course somewhat recently. Like he was supposed to go up some other epic peak instead of the double um whistler i can't confirm this maybe mm. some commenters can but um so that might have changed gary's original plan for the event possibly um but there was a really cool section maybe 20 something miles in where we were going through this it was almost like a peat bog like really spongy ground section through the forest there's lakes just everything's covered in moss, these big trees. I thought that was really cool. It really felt like the Pacific Northwest experience. Um, kind of not a lot of big vistas still, but it was right. it was a really cool section running through I think it. You yeah, talked I about talked that about that sec section specifically because we get, I mean, here the kind of bright green mossy everywhere is pretty common here, but especially places like Orcas Island and the Gorge. Um, but I, I commented specifically on how squishy the ground was for like such a long time. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I almost station, lost a shoe. Come in, you're like, the ground yeah. is so squishy. Yeah. It's so squishy. I'm like, that's that's a good thing, right? Like, that's good. It's but it was soft. almost like bouncy. It was pretty crazy. Yeah, I don't so know getting... what it was. I don't know if it was like just years of pine needles getting crushed down or just who knows. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I'm from the desert. I don't know what this stuff. Is. Man, welcome to the Northwest. Like our ground is softer here. Uh, yeah. We take care of your feet. Um, so at this point, are you getting fatigued? Are you are you thinking about these giant peaks that you have ahead? Like, is it is that where your mind is in these early miles, or is it are you not even there yet, and you're kind of processing other shit that's going on? I I don't know if I don't even remember what I was thinking about. Um, I think I was kind of wanting to get up there definitely um because that to me that's the stuff i love the most and, w and when i actually did get up there i mean it was in the dark by the right. time i did get up you know up towards whistler peak or whistler mountain and kind of doing that traverse across um but you could still tell even though it was dark out that it was just awesome like you're above tree line you just be big boulders everywhere and you're just scrambling along there was a section with ropes and chains on the side of a cliff just, and that's when I really started feeling, feeling more alive. Like, okay, this is awesome. I love this kind of stuff. I just wish we could play up here all day, all night. And how long of a climb was it to get to the top for you? So you, you summit Whistler mountain twice. So, yeah. and the route you take is essentially you like reverse it, right? Exactly. So can you kind of give us that stage set the stage for that yeah i feel like this was a crucial moment for a lot of hundred miles yeah that, cl that climb up it was actually on a like a really you're on the side of like a canyon is maybe the best way to describe it. you're kind of side traversing but you're on this steady uphill grind and there's not a lot of turns it's just a straight line basically you're just going up and then it makes a switch back and then you're like on the ridge once you drop down the other side you go back to the whack aid station and then you have to go right back up it and that trail was crazy. Um, really? Yeah, it was kind of, it was definitely a, a turning point for me where it just, I don't know if things like fell apart for me, but I just couldn't make good time going down it. And turns out, I was talking to Gary at the end of the race, and that's an old, some old trail that he personally helped reclaim. 
Hmm. So he went, he found it, he went out there and he like was like recutting vegetation away to open it back up. Um, so it was just gnarly. I mean, everything out there is so wet, all the, all the roots and the rocks. So you have to take your time going down. It's extremely steep. There's yeah. I don't know how else to describe it other than, um, going down. It might've been slower than going back up it just because you had to be so careful. I remember you saying that exact thing at the aid station where you were, you had just done the two Whistler summits. We caught you after the the second descent and you're about ready to go up black home, which is essentially the last big climb of the, of the race. There's still lots of climbing left. Uh, but you mentioned that it was almost more dangerous to come down one side than go up it, or it would take you longer. And there's some serious technical sections with chains and platforms and, and the like, did you experience anything like that in a race before? Um, not quite like that. Cause yeah, I mean, Whistler, I think is famous for their mountain biking. So I think some of the stuff in this section was old, seemed like old mountain bike platforms, but I don't even know how you would ride down some of this stuff. It, it looked like a death wish. <laughs> I have no idea. Do you, uh, I know you've been mountain biking, you've added some mountain biking races into the Air Viper lineup and stuff like that. Is this yeah. something where you would bring a bike back to Whistler and see if you can oh my God. get That's out there? Above, <laughs> it's above, I think some of it, I think it'd be fun, yeah. Some of it, most of it was probably above my skill level, but I'm sure they have some easier. Yeah, um, Jamil, it was all above your skill level. It. <laughs> it was, <laughs> so. I don't know, some of those trails are, I mean, some of the best in the world, like mountain yeah. bikers from around the globe go to Whistler for some of these yeah. lines. Did you ever have to, did you ever encounter any mountain bikers out there? Cause I know you share a lot of the same trails and the courtesy in Whistler is fantastic. Uh -huh. Like they tend to be great trail sharers, but did you run into a whole squads out there? There was, I think I may have only seen two or three guys out there. Um, but one guy was kind of going back and forth with a little bit, but he took some, I was impressed. He took some lines down some of these boulders that were really steep that I would never, ever attempt on a bike. Hmm. It was, it was cool. But yeah, hmm. everyone was nice. Everyone I saw out there was, was great. Let's get some live questions for Jamil. Yeah. So in regards to there being potentially another big, beautiful climb in the original plans. So my, what, what I thought was the reason is kind of what the people in the chat room are talking about as well. So on the one side of the freeway where we don't really go up in the first 15 or whatever yeah. miles, there's grizzly territory up top there. So the original intent, or it sounds like the original intent may have been to like hit up one of the glaciers on that side, but that's no longer allowed. So that was part of the reroute. And then last year also the grizzlies and snow caused reroutes last year. So I think that's why the additional Double makes sense. Double Whistler yeah. summit fun. I know Gary has run into just these are super unique challenges for a race director to encounter. It's grizzly territory. This is new, right? Grizzlies this far south in BC. There's there's just there's grizzly territory up in that region. Mm -hmm. There's not. It's not like on the on the one side where we actually do get up high on Whistler and Blackcomb. That's not grizzly territory. Right. So, yeah. But I mean, we I mean, encountered. <laughs> Specifically, when I was leaving the first aid station, I shined my headlamp on a sign right before I was rolling out, and it was a grizzly in the area sign. It's like, the trail you are going on is a grizzly trail. Enjoy your hike, but be safe. <laughs> it's just a giant, bright yellow sign, and Kim's like, what is that? I'm like, don't read it. Don't read it. Just, just go. Just go. <laughs> just keep going. Like, it's, so, it's so big. It's like six feet. Did you see any tall. bears out there? He actually, yeah, I did. Um, it was coming off Blackcomb, right on the ski resort area. Uh, There's all these ATVers that had pulled off to the side. And one of their friends actually rode her ATV off the road. It was like in a ditch. And we were running down. We're like, oh, that sucks. And then they're all just pointing. They're like, oh, look over here. And they're just taking pictures of the bear. They don't even care about their friend. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. Well, and we I didn't hope care she about got the down either. safe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I hope they I'm got sure their selfies. Uh, yeah, it was like our first, it's been years since we've been to Whistler, and our first hour, uh, a bear rolled through Basically our Basically looked in our yard. house's window. Yeah, like, I was just like, hey, what's up? And I was like, hey, the welcoming community's here. Um, so bears are just a part of the scenery there. I feel like they're as docile as deer and very common. But Grizzlies is another thing. And I know, so the race and Gary had to go through so many different 
iterations over the last couple of years with snow with grizzlies so this was like the first year that he was able to do everything as he had imagined it other than that peak which i don't think he'll be able to touch right. because of the grizzly territory so at any point during this race were you conversing with other 100 mile runners at all about like being the first humans to do this route to do this line like was there any sort of uh camaraderie amongst the runners of like we got to get this done because it's we we're go- our names are going to be etched in the history of this race as the first? <laughs> uh, I don't think the conversation really went there. Um, mostly it was just, you know, there was definitely meeting other runners out there. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of time spent alone too, mm. um, which was great, especially after coming from being over in Europe at OCC where, you know, you can't even get a, th- a thought of your own because there's so many people around. It was nice to have some solitude out there. Mm. Um, but it was also nice to link up with some people. I was running with um, uh, Ellie Gerben, right? Yep. Yes. Yep. Ellie Gerben. I was running with him for quite a while. We were kind of going back and forth, so that was fun. Yeah, we. every time we'd see him, he'd be like, Jamil, I think it's just right here. And actually, when we saw you at the second descent off of Whistler, he thought you were ahead of him. He's like, oh, Jamil has to have come through here like 30 or 45 minutes ago. <laughs> You're I like, see I was like, I don't know if he's come through. And then you come rolling in and Ellie was like, how did I get past you? And your response was very Jamil. And it was, yeah, I think I was sleeping. I, was, <laughs> I think I stepped off the trail and was sleeping it. or something. <laughs> so I don't know if he passed you. I don't know if you were sleeping at any point, but that was your answer. And I don't know if it was, I think it was just I think, funny. I don't I think at some actually. point, almost everyone was taking at least a short one minute nap up, uh, going up Whistler on the backside. There was a lot was of it people. Just slow? It was slow. It was just a big climb. It's a yeah. 5,000 foot climb. And you just, it was like three, four, five in the morning. Uh, you're just tired. What would you say was the lowest part for you? Like the low point? Did you hit a low? Did you hit a, I don't want to do this anymore sort of <laughs> spot? Do you ever go there anymore? I mean, I was in a pretty negative space around mile 90 because I was kind of hoping that somehow it was going to be right at a hundred miles. And I think I got to the mile 98 station and they're like, yeah, you have 25 K to go. And it became pretty apparent that that was accurate. And I was like, dang it. Uh, <laughs> like, and then it was interesting because the, the 105, 110 K takes this short little shortcut. Maybe you guys talked about that. It like cuts left. There's this junction. And we go right and then do all this squiggly spaghetti mountain bike trail for five or five miles. And uh, yeah, I was like, can we just take the little shortcut? <laughs> but, you know, the section I think you're talking about is comfortably, comfortably numb. numb. And also the section that Ellie had talked about as well. Every hundred mile finisher that we managed to see or touch base with after the race mentioned this section <laughs> called comfortably numb, which I think there are races that are set just on this trail. There are Gary's used it in multiple distances in the past. Um, it is the it is a point A to point B, but the actual distance that you're traveling is closer to point A to point C because the switchbacks are so close and so gradual that you actually never know if you're climbing or descending or if you're going the right direction. And runners have gotten lost not lost, but like turned around where they're thinking, I've been on this for an hour and a half. I think I, did I turn around? Yeah, we heard, we heard, uh, feedback that some people had kind of felt like lost out there for 45 minutes and weren't sure if they were going the right way. And Ellie had talked about like looking at his watch Mm -hmm. and it just not clicking over. Because the switchbacks are so close that the watch doesn't actually process distance. How was that section for you, Jamil? (laughs) I mean, I get it. It was beautiful. You know, there's trees and moss and stuff. But yeah, (laughs) I was just kind of, I want this to end. (laughs) Very similar experience. Yeah, it's just, you just feel like you're running in circles and not getting anywhere. Uh, That sounds like the perfect thing to put at mile 90 to 95 of a hundred mile race. And that sounds like a very Gary thing to put at mile (laughs) 90 to 95. Uh, Again, we are live with Jamil Curry talking about the Wham 100 inaugural hundred miler up in Whistler. Kim, live questions. What do we got? 
Yeah, a question from Deb in the chat room. Deb says, Jamil, any unusual events for you occur during the Whistler 100 miler? Example, coming across an elderly couple with a flat tire that needed help. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, unusual events. Shoot. No, I can't think of anything offhand. My mind is mush right now. Um, Did you hallucinate? Not really. Um, no. There was a so ton you didn't of. She pushed that hard. I no, I really <laughs> didn't. That's why I, like I said, I feel like relatively okay right now. Um, let's see. There was a ton of tourists that were um, up on Blackcomb. That was mm -hmm. interesting. They, a lot of them seemed to have no clue what was going on. Yeah. Um, and like. Yeah, I get we should have common courtesy probably like, you know, it's not like I'm more entitled to use this trail because I'm at mile 88 and you're just a family on a hike. But it, in the moment, it felt as if I should be more entitled. Um, <laughs> so I got a little upset when people weren't giving me the right of way. <laughs> and at one point, this girl kind of shoulder checked me as I was trying to get around her. And I was like, don't you see I'm in pain? <laughs> Can't you move? <laughs> but yeah, it's all good. Uh, we actually have her. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're going to bring her on. Oh, the we'll bring show. her on the show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. Go ahead. Oh, get to that. just really uh, quickly here. Andy in the chat room says, "Comfortably numb was like the Blair Witch Project. I was sure we were going in in circles. I actually etched an X in the end of a stump to see if we went by it again." <laughs> 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 Sounds about right. That's ridiculous. I mean, I. Of course, in my coherent mind, I'm like, who could possibly get turned around on this trail? But I mean, like 15 different runners have talked about the horrors of that one section. <laughs> yes. It's because your mind is just so done. And you want to just be at that finish line and you have this climb and these switchbacks. Uh, I, it's ridiculous. It makes me just want to do it. I'm not I'm not calling my shot. I'm not calling my shot. Because Gary has also said, like, this is an expert absolute expert level event um yeah what sort of things do you think make it that oh man i mean just the I and mean, there's a lot um kind of the self-sufficiency required there's some aid like it's a long ways between some of the aid stations so there's yeah there's not i mean granted there's great support but yeah you're out there um if the wet and the weather can be dicey, if you're out on some of these exposed sections, which are already challenging enough when I was going over them in the daylight with great weather, I couldn't even imagine if there was snow or sleet um, or rain, it would have been a different story. You just can't make very fast time. Yeah. So, yeah. What would you say is probably one of your favorite parts about this? I think I know what it is. I just would love to hear you sort of describe that, like your favorite moment from this event. Oh, it was topping out on Whistler Mountain during at sunrise. It was, I have the moment on, I actually did pull out my GoPro. It was tucked way back in my pack and I really wasn't in the mood for it. I wanted to just enjoy it, but I'm like, I gotta get this. So um, that was unbelievable. And I got up to the aid station sat down um they made they were making pancakes so it was just it was a great moment just to and look you, around and see the sea of white underneath you because you had gotten above the inversion layer and it was the sunrise yeah i was above it so yeah and the clouds were a ways below like it wasn't wow. even near us it was it was awesome did you run into any sort of temperature issues at all because the, like the high alpine versus the low stuff is you know 15 20 degrees fahrenheit different it was, I mean, it was cold, but I, I had all the right gear. Um, I mean, they require a lot of gear for this race, good right. you know, gloves and jackets and all that kind of stuff. So, um, no, not really. Didn't really have any issues. Actually, I think descending into some of the inversion, it was actually got colder. Mm -hmm. Probably because the sun is at, was out up top. So it was, it was comfortable up top once the sun did come out. Let's get to a couple more live questions. Uh, yeah, another question from A2B2. They asked, Jamil, was there anything you encountered during Wham that you would bring back to Aravipa events? Um, yeah, I think some of the short flags that Gary was using for his course markings, we have, um, it's different because we have really hard ground here, so it's not easy to just push flags in everywhere. 
uh, which is the nice thing about the Pacific Northwest, I think. So we're, we usually tie our ribbons or we have, you know, he's just staples a lot of his signs to trees. Um, and we have to use ground stakes cause we don't have many trees, but yeah, probably some shorts, short, some of the short pin flags would be convenient at some of the events that, um, have better ground. I don't know. Uh, do you have any words for Gary? Do you have any, uh, you may have words. spoken some to him at the finish Gave line, but now you've had some sleep. <laughs> uh, you are good friends with Gary. You've, you've done Barkley, many laps at Barkley with Gary. You know him very well. And, um, do you have any words for him regarding the wham? Thank you for the sushi at the finish line. That was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, it was just, I guess it was just awesome to finally do one of his races and to experience what it's like. Um, and I couldn't have thought of a better one to do than the inaugural wham. So I don't know if I'll do it again, but I'm glad I did it. Well, we're stoked, man. We're stoked for you. We were so happy. Well, I was happy to get to see you out there. I know Kim wasn't because she was running her own race at the same time. <laughs> but uh, being able to see you come into that aid station and go through your drop bag and try to find something to like, basically, you reached a point where you're like, I don't know what sounds good at this point. And I think someone's like, do you have like an energy drink? And you went, I have a monster. I have a monster <laughs> energy drink. I was like, I'll get it for you. And I remember pulling it out and popping it open. And I don't think you touched it. I don't think you, you ended up touching it. I drank the, the whole breath. thing. Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> I saved you. Maybe you were more tired than I was. I, mean, yeah, I might have been. But I do know that you ate a lot of hash browns, and that was pretty yeah, awesome to see. Someone had McDonald's hash browns at that aid station for some reason. I ate three of them, so that was definitely good. Uh, Jamil Curry, I'm so happy for you that you're able to get this done. Are, do you have any of the plans for the year, or was this kind of that, let's just get this thing, let's get this done, and that's it for 2019? I think this is it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, we'll see. I might hop into something later in the year, but... Just Barkley training is the next thing on the horizon. There you go. You always happen to Havelina. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's uh, it's sold out. Is it sold? It's sold out. Yeah, Sorry, I can't man. get into it. So. Sorry, yeah. I can't get into it. Uh, well, congratulations to you. Your finish time was thirty. I don't. I didn't have it pulled oh, up. Oh, you're professional. I'm totally professional. <laughs> thirty was 30 it thirty-two. To something like forty. I don't even know. Uh, it was before thirty-three. So. Uh, Kim literally pointed on the screen like, just click the just results click button that right you have there. right there. Well, what I wanted to also read was some of the other uh, results from the races. But um, congratulations, Jamil, on getting it done. The inaugural Whistler Alpine Meadows 100. You, my friend, get one of those buckles. Do it for Yay. the buckle. There it oh, is. Oh, there it is. Yeah, actually, let me get you, get you close up on you. Those are some, that's some pretty flashy hardware. It's cool. And he's got the actual, it says inaugural race 2019, which I really appreciate. It's very cool. I'm already Nothing wearing like it. That will ever exist so. again. Fantastic. I also wanted to make sure that we gave a shout out to uh, uh, the men and women winners from this event, the 100 mile race. Scott McGuire, which I believe was his first attempt at this distance. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 24 hours, 36 minutes and seven seconds. Uh, Dennis Callerteg uh, at 25 hours, 56 minutes, 15 seconds. And Jared Campbell uh, with 26 hours, 55 minutes, and 15 seconds. And on the women's side, uh, Mariev Legrand with 30 hours and 21 seconds. Joanna Ford, 32 hours, 59 minutes, 14 seconds. And Brigitte Martin Martinson at 36 hours, 51 minutes, and 36 seconds. And I also believe that Mariev broke the top 10 overall. As she well. did. I believe she did. She was crushing it all day, and it was really cool to see. Barely broke a sweat. It looked like she was just having a blast out there. Uh, and broke the top 10 overall, which is fantastic. And it was a really cool story. Chipping Foo's, uh, if you run ultras or you run hundreds, you probably know this guy's name. He's attempted, I believe, 90 plus hundreds at this point. Uh, we've seen him at multiple 100 uh, mile races here on the West Coast, but he came into the 100 mile finish line with three seconds to spare with a 48 hour cutoff. So it was 47 hours, 59 minutes, and 57 seconds. Oh and my gosh. Literally three <laughs> seconds to spare. Got it done. That is a long time to be out in the Whistler Alpine. I'm sure he was also cursing after his watch clicked over to 100 and realized <laughs> how far he was from the finish line. A lot of really interesting stories from that weekend. And uh, to everyone who even attempted any of these distance races out there, hats off to you because it just sounded 
incredible. Uh, Jamil, do you have any words of advice for anyone maybe looking to attempt any of the distance is out there at the Whistler Alpine Meadows series? Uh, bring a bear canister. Um, no, but in all seriousness, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Just, yeah, come prepared, read Gary's emails, and um, be prepared for all kinds of crazy weather, I think. Hey, Jamil, remind people where they can find you because you have lots going on on all different uh, websites and videos and stuff like that. And when can we expect the Whistler video to drop? Um, I think I really want to get it done by tomorrow. So that's the plan. I want to get this one out quick because I have not been very good and timely at my videos lately. So we're going to try and change that, get this out quick. Um, so hopefully tomorrow night we'll we'll get this edited out. Um, yeah, you can find me at Jamil Curry. The video will be at Run Steep Get High on YouTube. Um, yeah, that's all. Perfect. Dude. Very simple. Cannot thank our wonderful guest enough for joining us, Jamil Curry. Uh, make sure you follow him across social media and, and all that good stuff. Show him some love. Thank him for being on the show. A huge congratulations to him, our friend Ellie, our friend Caitlin, also another guest of the mm -hmm. show who uh, set the female course record at the 55K. Yes. Lots of records broken this weekend. Just lots of badass performances out there. Really, really cool to see. And of course, Kim, we're going to talk about your 110K race at the Whistler Alpine Meadows in our after show. Great. Uh, but before we get to that, we have a new segment every week that we like to uh, recognize members of the community, showcase those who are also kicking ass out there, viewers and people of our GR Crew community. We call it our GR Crew Member of the Week. Kim, who is our Crew Member of the Week? This week's GR Crew Member of the Week is um, staying in theme with the Wham race. Sweet. So this week's GR Crew Member of the Week is the one and only Wing Taylor. Yeah. Who completed the Wham 100 miler. Congratulations, Wing. Um, shout out to you, my friend. And uh, shout out to John Maxwell and other members of the community who also were attempting yes. and finished and crushed out there. There's a lot of you guys out there. Uh, but Wing, we know that you have uh, wanted this for a long time and uh, Wing's been really gracious with his time with us and support and all that good stuff. So Wing, congratulations to you, my friend. You earned it. What a tough race. Does it interest you at all to go back? Uh, not for the 100, but for the 110K, yes, oh. absolutely. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to talk more about Kim's race in our after show. If you would like to join us, it's very easy to do. All you got to do is go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. For as little as a dollar, you get access to all of our after shows, which are the segments that we do with our guests after our main shows. Every single week, you have access to the live version, the archive version, and the future versions uh, each and every month. So thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Ginger Runner Live, episode number 277 with Jamil Curry, our good friend, uh, reliving a little bit of the Whistler Alpine Meadows goodness. Uh, it was great to have him on the show tonight. I think that's it. Am I forgetting anything? That's it. Cool. Get out there. Train hard. Race harder. And prepare for GRGR19 because it's coming up on October 13th. If you'd like to register, Yay. digital downloads are still available at rungrgr.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Bye.